So, uh, thank you all and welcome you again. So, my name's Adam and I head up admissions and student recruitment at our School of Sport and Exercise Sciences. I'm going to be hosting today and uh, delivering the session. We've got Dr. Rachel Churn. So, hi, Rich. Hiya. Uh, do you want to begin by telling uh, everyone a little bit about yourself and your background, first of all? Gosh, yeah. Um, so, I'm, as you say, Dr. Rachel Churn. I came from a very long way to the sports science department from the med school. So I went from Singleton campus to Bay campus in Swansea University when I started there last June. But yeah, so I went to Aberystwyth University for my bachelor's degree and I did biochemistry and genetics. So I'm not a born and bred sports scientist and I can't run very fast or far either. So then sports equipment and facilities don't do me much good. But what they also have is really good labs where I spend most of my time. So a lot of work that I do is based on cell biology and how sports and how that can be impacted by physical activity and health. It's a really good example really of how um, the work we do cuts across lots of different sectors, uh, whether it is exercise uh, or whether it is activity and health and the types of scientists um, that can make impact in sports. So yeah, it's a really good example there, Rachel. Uh, I'll hand over to you then uh, for you to deliver your presentation and share screen and we'll come back for question and answer at the end then. Amazing. So if I do this. The talk that I'm going to give today is a little bit, I think some of the stuff you guys would know, you would have seen in the news, in the press, obviously obesity is quite a big quite a big thing, excuse the pun, as, um, as the world is going on. So yeah, so I'm here today to talk about the real Hunger Games, the implications of obesity. So I should start by saying that my background is very much focused on obesity. And I, the research that I do looks a lot at how your body stores your fat and how that in, can have implications on your health. So the session I've split, it's only going to be about 20, 25 minutes and I've split this then. So we're going to have a bit of a obesity 101. What the effect obesity has on your body and how that can impact your health and why this matters. So a lot of things can impact your health, but why does this matter per se to us, to the community and to the world that we're living in? And then what research that A, I'm doing personally in the area and what research is out there just in the general field. So the evolution of obesity. So thousands and millions of years ago when we were all hunters and foragers and gatherers, I don't think we were sitting there with the McDonald's in our cave, living our best life on Netflix. No, I think that the evolution of obesity, as we've come through time, we've spent less energy searching and looking for our food and more, and, and instead spending time just sitting there and eating higher density food or food then that is more easily available. Okay. So in essence, you're spending less energy out and you're taking a lot more energy in and that is in the crisp of it what obesity is it's just this long-term positive energy balance yeah so it's this long-term uh, influx of extra calories so we measure obesity uh, based on bmi so clinically you would base somebody you would say if somebody was obese they would have a bmi of over 30. So that essentially that means is, is that you will be carrying more mass than what your height says that you should be, okay? So that ratio is off. So if you have a BMI of over 25, you'd be considered to be overweight. If you have a BMI of over 30, you'd be considered to be obese. I find this ridiculous, personally, because my BMI is over 25. But then I like to think to myself, that you have to take into consideration things like your waist circumference. Um, so you can have individuals, especially athletes or people who are very physically active, who could be doing a lot of weight training and could therefore have a higher BMI, but would actually have quite a small waist circumference. OK, so their risk factor in health and disease then would be lower. So as time is going on, obesity has become a global, not pandemic, epidemic. 
So essentially what this means is, is that this is now a problem everywhere, okay? So before where we used to see obesity being a big issue in our developed countries, we are also now seeing obesity coming into the forefront in non-developed countries as well. So it's expected now that by 2030, at the current rates of obesity, there will be an estimate, there will be an estimation of 11 million more. So that's not include the ones which are already asked. There's 11 million more obese adults. So how does this all come about? What, what is happening? So as I said, it's all about this uh, positive, it's all about this positive energy then, yeah? So you've got positive energy, but not in a good way. But positive energy balance. So you, you've got too many calories going in than what you were spending going out. There's also a lot of other reasons as well that um, individuals can become obese and or individuals can suffer health complications related to obesity. And these can span from economic factors. So individuals who are from a lower social economic status. So for instance, if you were from a more deprived area, then the incidence of obesity seems to be higher. Um, your physical environment, your nutrition, your diet is just poor and then a lot of other things as well so things like lactation things that might have happened when you were in the womb of your mother your home life virus your physical activities and like i said food intake then all of these factors kind of depend on one main thing as well and that is your genetic predisposition some people have just got off on the wrong foot straight from the get-go Okay, so some people may be, pre, may be predisposed to being affected by obesity. And that might be because certain genes that make up your characteristics um, may be overexpressed, or you might have too much of one or too little of another. And they then mean that other hormones that you produce that regulate your feeling of hunger, or your feeling of um, fullness, you might be miscommunicated to your body. So that then, in conjunction with an intake of energy uh, and a decrease in energy expenditure, is going to result in your body storing more fat, okay? And then that means that you're going to need more fat cells to store all of this fat in, okay? So that's what a dipogenesis is. So that's just maturing cells into fat cells. And then you're going to end up becoming overweight and then eventually lead to obesity. So obesity is defined as an excess fat mass that impairs health. So by impairing health, as we all know from recent times, that also means that you're also going to be affecting the NHS. So the UK spends £48 billion a year dealing with obesity-related health and social care. That is a lot of money. And that's because obesity is affecting a lot of people. So obesity is, it, individuals are expecting, I think 67% of men in the UK are said to be overweight or obese, and 61% of females are said to be overweight or obese currently in the UK. So that just kind of puts it into scale of things as to how many people this is affecting and how that can impact the services that we have around us. So how, why, why does obesity affect your health and that comes down to several things and often or not it's not the things that we might think so obesity is as we said it's you having too much fat but fat in itself is uh, quite a complex subject because you can have brown fat white fat or beige fat so in obesity what you're seeing is is an increase in white adipose tissue so white fat and this is the fat that's quite bad so this is your storage of dietary fat okay so your brown fat is actually really good so that's the fat that you have when you're um a baby and you first come out into the world you've got to deal with a freezing cold labor ward and then but no you have brown fat so that's thermoregulatory so that helps you regulate your temperature when you're a child but that fat dissipates as you get older and you don't really see much of it as you come into your adult self and it's this white fat that we have now. And then where is your fat? So if I was to look at Barbara then, 
and say that she wasn't essentially obese or overweight or something, I'd be looking at her as a, a subcutaneous fat. So the fact that we squeeze, the fact that we go, oh, she pinch an inch, that's your subcutaneous fat. That fat actually doesn't represent bad fat on your body, not in relation to disease and health anyway. So the fat that we talk about when we talk about obesity and disease is your visceral fat. So this is the fat that surrounds your organs. And that then can be split up into different subsections, as you can see on the guy standing there. So the one that I spend a lot of my time talking and working on is a mental fat, okay? So that's inside your stomach cavity, your abdomen cavity. And then how fat is your fat? So in essence, your fat cell stores lipid fat. So this lipid then, the more lipid that you have within that fat means the more stressed out that cell is. And this is where we start getting problems, okay? So when that stress cell is super stressed, when that fat cell, sorry, is really stressed, it produces, it releases different um, hormones and different proteins and different factors that are going to have a negative effect then. This leads me into what is your fat releasing, okay? So there could be markers that could uh, promote the growth of certain cells then. There could be markers that would change the way that your body treats your blood sugar. There could be factors that changes the way your body deals with stress or oxidation. Okay, so all of these factors then, also, they are markers that change the way that your body deals with your feeling of hunger. So by stressing out these cells, you're having a huge knock-on effect to the rest of your body. So this year is, so if you go through our, our four, four points there, so this year now is white adipose tissue, a diagram that I've done myself amazingly in paint, I know. So essentially what we've got here is your adipocyte cells and the TG stands for triglyceride. So this is the lipid droplet inside them, yeah? So as you can see, as your dietary intake, in, uh, as your dietary intake is increased, what you see here is your cells are storing more fat. As that cell is filling up with this triglyceride then, they're becoming stressed or hypertrophic. And fat cells can't just divide, they can't just keep expanding, okay? They get stressed, they get hypertrophic, they're under pressure, all right? If you imagine all these are all full of little stretch marks now. So what we have here then, which are the cells which are indicated with a nice little red boundary around them, is a hypertrophic fat cell. So this cell now is sending out all of its nasty markers, it's hard enough with the world, and it's releasing all, these, all of these proteins and hormones and factors into your bloodstream. We call this then inflammation. And then this inflammation will go on in your bloodstream and it will act on various different sites in your body, okay? It doesn't just act locally in your adipose tissue. And it can go on to affect your skeletal muscles and other organs, such as your liver, okay? And this can have effects on your health. It can change, as it says here, your cholesterol metabolism, so it changes the way that your liver deals with your fat, it, deal, it changes the way that your liver deals with your blood sugar. And it also changes the way that your muscles utilize your energy. So why does this matter? So this slide is quite intense, but in essence, if we were just to look um, on the top three, so if you look over the 15 to 49 years of age, 50 to 69 years of age and 70 plus. If you look at the top three there for me, you can see that a high body mass index is present right up the top on all three categories, okay? So what this is showing is, is the top 10 global burden of disease identified risk factors for disability adjusted life years. What that means is, is um, it's adjusted for how many years, how many healthy years have been lost, okay? So this is a mortality, this is how many healthy years have been lost, so how, when you get to your older ages, how many of them years have kind of been stunted, you're not healthy anymore, you can't live life to your best, yeah? 
In gym, I should mention on mortality though, Mortal obesity is seen to affect your mortality by five, uh, sorry, expect your life expectancy by five to 10 years. Okay, so it's a major, major problem. And it has a major effect on quite a lot of people. So as I said now, so this year now is looking at across all three groups and it is, you will be losing um, healthy years mainly down to high body mass index. But as we just mentioned, is that obesity affects quite a few things. So it's not just your BMI, it is your, the fat that are circulating around in your, um, in your blood. It's your blood glucose, your blood sugars. And if we see here that the top 10 is full, it's littered with all of these markers of obesity, okay? So you've got dietary implications, like diets low in, fruits, low in nuts and seeds, low in whole grains, okay? So it's not just that BMI that matters, it's that whole package that obesity brings, okay? Or the metabolic state that we sometimes refer to it is where you end, where you end up in this cluster of individuals who are overweight or obese, but they also have then problems with controlling their lipid levels in their blood. They, cut, they struggle controlling their blood glucose levels. It's like this package that comes along. And then this leads to disease, okay? So obesity has been associated with several hundreds of diseases I most probably could imagine, but I haven't got time to go through all of them with you in 20 minutes. Um, so I've just kind of picked up the ones that I think will affect um, the most, which are most known to affect people then. So fatty liver disease, so it changes the way that your body uh, sorts out the uh, sorts out the removal of fat. So you end up storing loads of fat in your liver. So I did a study once where we looked, at, uh, we did bariatric, uh, we took a mental sample. So we had to go into bariatric surgery, so weight loss surgery, and the surgeon would do keyhole surgery, and they'd have to move the liver out of the way to get to the stomach to do the operation. But the patient would have to go on a diet first because obviously these individuals are morbidly obese and their liver has stored up so much fat that the surgeon couldn't actually physically lift the liver out of the way to get to the, to get to the stomach. So, and then obviously having a fatty liver like that is going to have major implications to your health. So there's again, fatty liver disease, kidney disease, high blood pressure, Sleep apnea, so sleep apnea is trouble breathing when people are sleeping, yeah. Uh, fertility in both male and females. Osteoarthritis, stroke, cancer, heart disease, and type two diabetes. So the ones in red are the three that I'm going to give a quick summary on today, mainly because of those are the ones which I work quite closely with, and I can give um, a bit of a, further in depth into the research that's going on into Swansea in these three areas. But what I will say is, is that, as I mentioned with mortality, is that obesity contributes to at least one in every 13 deaths in Europe. That is ridiculous, if you ask me. So there's a big reason why we do this research, okay? So I've gone straight into type two diabetes here, and that's because as you will see that this pathway that I'm going to summarise quite quickly um, impact the others. So it's kind of the it's kind of the uh, kind of the starting ground then. So obesity is responsible for 80 to 85 percent of someone's risk of developing diabetes. Okay, so it's type 2 diabetes I'm talking about here. So obviously you have type 1 as well and gestational and other forms, but this we're just looking at type 2 diabetes. So it's predicted that by 2045, there will be 693 million cases of type 2 diabetes globally, okay? That is an astonishing amount of cases. And that rate is going up because the rate of obesity is going up, okay? So the pair of them are on an exponential trajectory. So they're just shooting for the stars, okay? And we need to do something about it because obviously the man, Type 2 diabetes can lead to very serious complications and even mortality. However, what they see in type 2 diabetes is, is that it's this visceral fat, okay? So 
okay? So it's having this fat in your abdomen that causes an increase in your risk, all right? So it's waist circumference is really important when you're talking about type 2 diabetes. So you're looking at, um, so you're looking at that, that abdom, abdomen fat. So studies have shown that if you were to lose weight, so it's also been shown through bariatric studies as well that have been completed by the Diabetes Research Group in Swansea Uni, that through having bariatric surgery, if you, you then lose a lot of weight post-surgery, and then that can send your type 2 diabetes into remission. And remission essentially means that you no longer need medication or help to control your blood sugars, or help manage your blood sugars, I should say. However, the direct study then, um, so this is a study funded by Diabetes UK, and they saw that 64% of the participants who lost 10 kilograms, so this was irrespective of their starting weight, so 64% of participants who lost 10 kilograms went into type two, had type 2 diabetes remission two years after the intervention, okay? So the reason why that's important is, is that when you look at any sort of um, lifestyle intervention. What you do in the lab in your study is amazing and great and people hopefully stick to it. But then once that's over, what we see then is, is that a lot of people uh, go back to their old habits and their old ways and it can be quite difficult to, to maintain the results that you see then. But if you hit this golden 10 kilogram weight loss mark, they saw that 64% of their participants were still in remission then. So obesity can, so why does obesity matter then? So why is it all about weight loss? And one of the reasons why they think that obesity, well, one of the reasons that they know that obesity has a massive impact in type 2 diabetes is because obesity can result in insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is simply where insulin sensitive tissues just simply aren't insulin sensitive anymore. Okay, you lose that sensitivity. And this happens through a number of processes. But um, mainly what happens is, is that insulin resistance can be seen in type 2 diabetes quite a long way before you have the actual um, diagnosis. And that's because your body is overproducing insulin because it's got all this sugar now that it has to deal with. And your body is overproducing it and overproducing it. And your, do you remember all them nasty... Uh, cytokines and factors and the different kinds and hormones that were and proteins that were being produced by this stressed out adipose tissue. Well, all of them now are having really negative effects and, um, in a sense, are attacking or attacking the way that the cells that produce your insulin are functioning. So you end up losing loads of cells or losing uh, cell function for the cells that are producing your insulin. And you're having, you're just kind of being flooded with insulin as well. So then, in the end, you become insulin resistant, and then this therefore means that you struggle to maintain solid blood glucose levels or to manage your blood glucose levels. So then, I go on to cardiovascular disease. And I should stress that cardiovascular disease and obesity has its own association with and without type two diabetes. But as I mentioned, such high numbers of cases, you get this metabolic state, as I said. So often many of these comorbidities, often many of these uh, associated diseases come as a package deal. <laughs> you end up down a slippery slope then. So cardiovascular disease is highly associated with type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. And adults with diabetes are two to three times more likely to have heart and circulatory disease. I say this, I'm also including um, things like blood pressure, stroke. So I'm kind of doing this from a heart overall, okay? And also, they're nearly twice as likely to die from the disease, all right? So it's not just increases, increasing your chance of getting it, but it's also increasing the chance of you dying from it. And again, a reduction of just 5 to 10% of body weight is seen to improve cardiovascular diseases in overweight and obese individuals. And weight loss was also found to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease mortality by up to 41%. Do you remember I was saying about how you do these things in the study and in the lab and you're like, yes, great result. 
And then if you were to follow up a few years later, we would actually find that everybody threw their 200 calorie a day diet in the bin and they've gone out to their normal life. But what this study saw was, was up to, up to 23 years after their original weight loss intervention, the protective effect of that then can still be seen in this, and their cardiovascular disease mortality risk is still reduced. And then on to one then, which is more topical. So as you may have seen in the news not so long ago, obesity came second in line to smoking for one of the leading causes of cancer in the UK. Obesity and cancer have always had quite an intrinsic relationship. And not much is known because many different cancer, many cancers act so um, in their own right. So whether you have cancer of the breast, colon, endometrial, endothelial, kidney, that cancer will have its own little signature then. However, quite a few cases of cancer, and I've only listed um, five there because they're the most common ones that um, have seen to be impacted by weight. Okay, And that's just weight gain. So um, it's obviously going to be impacted by overweight and obesity. But cancer has also been seen to be impacted by just weight gain. So this has resulted then in more than one in 20 cancer cases um, being a result of excess weight. Okay, So considering that they say that well, cancer affects every one in two of us, and that more than one in 20 of them cases are caused by excess weight, seems like a, quite an extreme amount of cancer. That could be um that could be impacted or could be um benefited then from having some sort of obesity management um scenario. So we see here that routine physical activity is associated in a reduction in the incidence of several malignancies. So malignancy is a part of the cancer profile. But what we see is physical activity can be seen in its own right to help uh to help individuals with cancer. So whether that be directly linked to weight loss or not, so it's, dependent, it's independent, okay? So physical activity can be seen to promote this positive um, effect on its own. But then also bariatric surgery can lower organ cancer risk with maximal weight loss. So what I mean by this is, is six months after individuals have had uh, bariatric surgery, um, the study that I'm thinking about in particular they looked at colon cancer. And so what they saw was, is that six months after having bariatric surgery, they saw a significant reduction in the colon cancer markers in the bloodstreams of their patients. So their risk, their, you know, their chances of having colon cancer were dramatically lowered by having bariatric surgery. And that was due to weight loss. So the individuals who responded really well to the surgery and lost loads of weight, their risk was reduced further, or reduced more, reduced greater than individuals who had um, who had lower um, weight loss. So aiming for that maximal weight loss will uh, greatly improve their risks. So where does that leave me? So um, I kind of wanted to put this in here because Adam told me that the audience was going to be mainly of um, you guys who are thinking about coming to Swansea University. But I think it's all well and good knowing about these things. You, in essence, you could have Googled it or watched BBC News and was probably seen half of this stuff. But I think that it's really nice for you guys to be able to see what this, how this links to Swansea Uni and how this could link to you. So the research that I do, so these are the projects that I have like um, dissertation students helping me on, or these are projects that we have like master's students, um, out for advert and PhD projects running in. And this is the type of work that we do. And this is the type of work that I literally do. So my research area is in obesity, prediabetes and diabetes. So as I mentioned, so I look at studies um, in bariatric surgery, where we analyze their key markers and um, certain time scales after the surgery to see whether they're, they're responding well, to see how their weight loss is going, to see how that's impacting their metabolic state. Um, I also look at lipid retention and your hormones. 
So I did a study to see whether the hormone that makes you feel hungry, whether that can change the way your body stores your fat. And that was great because we saw that it did. And that now means that we can figure out that pathway and we can build on it and try and find a way that we can change our levels of that hormone, whether we can impact, whether we can manipulate then the way that your body stores your fat through this hormone. That hormone's called ghrelin. It's kind of the pun for the title as well. So ghrelin, I think, is partially my life. But um, yeah, so it's your hunger hormone. Okay, that's what most people refer to it for. But it also has something ridiculous like 42 other peripheral actions other than just making you feel hungry. Okay. Um, and then, so as I say, a dip set biology. So I do work in the labs and I work a lot with the diabetes research group where we grow our own fat cells and we differentiate them into mature fat cells. And the photos that you've seen on here of the fat cells, those were all Swansea bone and bread fat cells. And so we look at how your adipocytes, how your fat cells deal with certain stressors and what we need to do to try and, um, to try and make them have the happiest, the healthiest life. So how can we, how can we influence them then to, produce less of the factors that are detrimental to your health. And then the main area of my work then, an area I would say that I'm most passionate for and a lot of what my projects are based around now, uh, how physical activity can alter your hormone response, okay? So we do all the work that looks at what the response is and like how that can affect your cells. But then that's all well and good. But if you can't figure out a way to alter it, if you can't figure out a way to make it work for you, then what are you going to do? So we, we look at how different forms of physical activity can change the way that your body stores your fat. So whether it could promote, um, whether it could promote utilizing that brown fat that we haven't had since we were babies, or whether we could use it to look at where so could you change um where your body stores your fat to it stores less in your abdomen abdomen cavity and how that then would have a knock-on effect on your hormone expression levels and your health and your state of health but i think yeah so again we look at brown versus white versus beige we look at where your fat is placed um how fat is your fat and what your fat is released in. So there are four key fundamentals that link obesity to disease. They're essentially um, where the projects are based around that I work in with Swans University and uh, sports exercise department. And there's just some references just to show that I wasn't making it all up really guys. But has anybody got any questions that you'd like to ask? Thanks for that, Rachel. Yeah, so if anyone does have any questions, um, just a reminder to use your Q&A button on your display there, and uh, I'll pitch them to Rachel to answer. While those are coming in, then, I've got a couple of questions to ask, first of all, then, Rachel. Um, you mentioned about BMI at the start, and with a degree of cynicism, uh, and rightly so, and I feel the same, and a lot of scientists, you know, have cynicism to how BMI isn't a very valid marker, but why is it the marker of choice? You know, why, why is it at the top levels? Why is that the thing that's used to determine obesity when people know that it's not entirely valid? I think that with, so it's a double-edged sword because essentially BMI compare is better than mass because mass isn't respective of your height or isn't expected, but then BMI isn't respective of your frame then, for instance, or your muscle. So then you go, well, why don't you use body fat percentage? But then your body fat could equate of your lean mass, um, your muscle mass, and your water mass. Is you know, there's a lot of things that you need to take into consider there as well. And BMI is something that in the community we can work out quickly. So if you're in your GP, you don't need specialist equipment to be able to work out. You need a weighing scales and something to measure your height with. So it's flawed. 
but most measures are flawed and that's why I always say it's better to have an array of them. So BMI on its own, we take it with a pinch of salt, but BMI in conjunction with other marker, with other measures um, actually works quite well. Um, and you mentioned as well about um, some economic or you know social factors that influence um, obesity. And it's absolutely right. Um, you know, I got some stats picked off where um, twelve point nine percent is prevalence of obesity yeah. in the most deprived um, four to five year olds versus half that uh, for the least deprived. Yeah, um, and it's the same at the age of ten to eleven, but that. Uh, age, the prevalence is much higher for both groups, where you've got 27% in the most deprived and 13% in the least. So it's doubling in effect uh, in prevalence of obesity from 4 to 5 to 10 to 11. Yeah. What happens in terms of child development um, at those ages that, um, that makes it more prevalent uh, for that? Well, to be perfectly honest, though, childhood obesity in itself is its own research area and the reason why I end caution when I talk about this is because as a lot of you as a lot of um, members of staff who work in the ASTEM department then will appreciate a lot of them do specialize in childhood areas and your body changes so much between the age of zero when you're born up until the age of 18 and to be able to reflect that change. So if you think about the change that your body goes through between the age of seven and eight or seven and 11 then, and the changes your body goes through between the age of 30 and 34, the level of change is ridiculously different. So for me to be able to comment on childhood obesity, I would I would err on the side of caution. But if I was to guess, I, well, not guess, but if I was to be, um, and everything about that, I would say that obviously puberty has a massive in influence on um, childhood obesity. It changes the way all of your body comes into play as well, so especially for women and for men. As I said, all of these networks and pathways are linked. When you start thinking about obesity, you need to start thinking about a whole body effect. Right, right. Uh, we've got some questions coming in thick and fast from the audience now, so I'm going to pitch uh, some of these to you, Rachel. Um, we'll go from the first one. If you were helping someone out who is med uh, medically obese, how would you start to get them back to a healthy BMI? If you were helping somebody out who is medically obese, I would say you've hit the nail on the head there. If somebody's already got medical implications in place, they need to go see their healthcare professional before they change anything drastic. Obviously, sit less, move more is the biggest thing that I can say. It's just on about like, just get moving, get going, get, you know, maybe instead of driving to the shop to get the snack that you really want, walk to the shop to get it. Or don't go, drive to the park instead. But again, like I said, as soon as you're talking about um, somebody who's medically obese, you need to speak to a medical professional. Um, I want to add on to that then and ask, yeah. when you talk about how um, losing 10 kilograms, for example, uh, increases the rate of remission or reversal of conditions, yeah. what are the factors that can actually influence the rate of losing 10 kilos, for example, or losing weight? You know, what are the yeah. genetic and physiological factors that impact that? Yeah, so losing weight somehow comes so much easier to others than to some but yeah so losing weight can be um individuals will know how easy or hard they find it to lose weight if you are at a calorie deficit then you will lose weight there's if some bets about it the rate in which you lose that weight may depend then on your genetics so some people do struggle to lose weight and that might be because they are genetically predisposed and i spoke about this at the beginning so that might be that um your so if i take a pick of some gene it could be there's several genes that could be involved but if i take a pick of um a gene that m might be more commonly heard of then is that, um, so there's a leptin gene. Leptin gives you a sense of satiety, so it's your sense of fullness. 
So if for some reason in your genetic makeup, you don't produce the right amount of leptin or your body doesn't respond correctly to your leptin, then what that means is then is that you won't feel as full and you will be at, at a tendency to eat more or you will feel that you aren't achieve, achieving in the way that you should be. And then there's other situations as well where um, that leptin then could have an implica Im implication, implication on um, how your body deals then with your weight loss. So there's always going to be genetic factors as well as environmental factors that can impact your weight loss. Um, there's a question in that vein from Neve that's come in as well. Uh, in your opinion, what are the healthiest options other than bariatric surgery to reduce long-term uh, health implications of obesity? I would say, I will stress, bariatric surgery is only available for um, tier four patients. So these are people who are now chronic, um, they've got complications. These individuals most probably will be pre will have pre-diabetes or will have type 2 diabetes. So they have some severe complications already linked to their obesity. Okay. Because so surgery at the end of the day, your doctor isn't going to want to just do surgery when it's not the, the best option for you. But what I would say were the best um route then or the healthiest route to go down is choosing something that you can maintain for a long time and that's not doing something fad or something ridiculous but it's doing something that you can maintain so changing your lifestyle so a lot of the work that i do is called lifestyle intervention i want you know we want to kind of intervene and give you a new way to kind of live your life whether that means that you drop a couple of hundred calories and whether you move more or whether we kind of re-educate how you look at your food and how you perceive what your daily exercise is. And I think as long as you can get to that attitude of just readjusting your mindset of maybe taking on less and doing more, then if that weight starts coming down, your complication risk will also go down. It's a very personalised thing as well, isn't it? What works yeah. for one person wouldn't for another and vice versa exactly like one one diet works for one and never the other does it and it's let alone the moral of the story is unfortunately and often weight loss is key you've got to maintain that weight loss and like i say we do studies it works amazingly in the lab and it works amazingly for 6 12 18 weeks and then you could catch up with one of your patients or one of your participants 18 months down the line and they're bigger than they were before you know you it, it needs to be something that can be sustained in terms of um, exercise then um to to reduce obesity as opposed to activity uh, in yes. terms of exercise what types of exercise and training methods are best yes. and does that differ from person to person based on how they are made as well yeah, so what I will say about exercise and the type of exercise that you do and personal preference then, it is preference. It depends what you're going to actually try at. So if I was to give you then an exercise programme, well, I wouldn't give it to you, but if I was to get a colleague to write up an exercise programme then for you to do, it could be entirely based on resistance work and that then is something that you might not enjoy you don't want to do and you'd rather do something that was high intensity and you were doing it for shorter periods of time but it was having a maximal um impact in that time so there is a balance to be played of what type of exercise you do and how long you can maintain that exercise then but different exercises are seen to have differing effects in different complications then so resistance exercise is seen to have um resistance exercise is seen to greatly help with um skeletal muscle so to allow you to rebuild your skeletal muscle so whether you when you're losing mass you want to be maintaining um your skeletal muscle you don't want to just be stripping yourself so to speak um, and then if you look at high intensity training there's a really cool study going on um, with in the department with uh, Rich Metcalf and um, I'm helping out a little bit I think um, on how exercise like high intensity training can impact cancer 
So if you were to treat with the plasma of uh, somebody who's just done uh, loads of exercise, loads of high intensity exercise, can this have a positive effect on um, cancer metastases? Richard's on the call, so there's a reason why I wanted us to hear it in that direction. We've also, got a, question. <laughs> We've also got a question from Melitta, who um, said it's a great presentation. Do the pathways for the effects of obesity differ between sexes? The pathways for, I haven't really looked into that much, but the pathways for obesity don't really differ for the sexes because at the end of the day, it's the same basic principle. As in, if you take on to, if you take, if you have too much of, a, if you take on too much dietary intake, then what you're going to end up is then with is an increase in white adipose tissue. That white adipose tissue then is going to result in hypertrophic cells. They're going to end up producing stress and factors that are negatively affecting the rest of your body and producing a systemic low grade inflammation that results in. X, Y, and Z. However, as we mentioned earlier about puberty and stuff like that, the differences that you might see in, ch in children, we also got to remember is, is that male and females are quite different biologically. And we also have different hormones that can impact the way that our body stores our fats as well. And depending on, so they, as it differs in male and females, it'll most probably differ as menopausal and postmenopausal or it would differ as child and post puberty then or adolescence so there's a lot of there's a lot of sex hormones that mm -hmm. can impact the way that your body deals with your fat um and as a follower then i was going to ask you yeah. um to what extent do you know or is it known generally how ethnicity would um, would impact on the genetic predisposition to to obesity, yeah. for example. So ethnicity does have um, a major role to play as well in because obviously it's part of your genetic makeup as well. However, we look at it as part of your genes, and also genetics is a uh, genetics and um, ethnicity plays a major role in um, ciphering as well with people who are predisposed to holding fat in their abdomen. And that and that can have that then has a knock on effect, especially in type two diabetes. So we see individuals of certain ethnicities are uh, at a greater risk of getting type two diabetes. Great. Um, there's a question: Why have you chosen ghrelin as your main interest of research? How about GLP one and PYY? So there's mainly because you've got to choose one because there's so much to look at for everything so i do do work in glp1 and pyy and i also do work in gip as well but that is stuff that's been related to the bariatric studies so um essentially ghrelin is the hormone that i have most interest for it was only really discovered about 10 15 years ago and since then the interest in it has skyrocketed and i enjoy the fact that it's really novel and there's not much that people truly understand because there hasn't been the time for the research to come out and the the so the interest for me with ghrelin is is i enjoy how just that feeling of hunger can result in all of these different implications and what they may be especially in terms of obesity and type 2 diabetes I mean, you mentioned uh, already as well how there's so many different, how, how the obesity problem can be split and there's so much work going on across yeah. lots of different areas. Is there anything in particular you feel is under-researched or is, is young in its, in its research span at the moment? So one area which I would love to research, but obviously when you have very naive areas, not naive, novel areas of research, it's sometimes be quite difficult to be able to justify why you had this really weird idea and you want to go for it and try and get the funding for that then. But one area which I think is quite novel is this idea of beige adipocytes. So it's essentially, I call them the Superman cells because they're like Clark Kent in the day. They're just an average white adipose tissue cell. And then when needs must, so normally it is um, like something like cold pressure or something like that, they can be induced then to act as brown adipose tissue. And it's that brown adipose tissue that has all them really good effects. 
it's kind of like the good fat then if you want to but yeah so if there was ever an area that i would go into it'd be looking at how we could kind of promote that like how we could ever how we could kind of promote that beige uh adipocyte phenotype then good uh just a couple more left then rachel um one is it low fitness or high fatness that contributes to a lower lifespan contribution of both so being fit is obviously going to impact your lifespan whether you take out your um whether you take out your bmi then so to speak because physical activity and fitness have this whole horde but there's 22 members of staff in ASEM that all work in each in a stream that was going to have its own impact on one stream of health that could um result in a longer lifespan then so yeah I think that it's a mixture of both and obviously if you were to counteract both you would kind of be if you counteract one you most probably be counteracting the other as well so they kind of go hand in hand even if you like it or not I think um, and then final question, um, they've, they've actually said themselves, this is a bit of a basic question, but I think it's the perfect question to end on. Do you think <laughs> we ever beat the obesity epidemic? Uh, well, no. <laughs> no, I think, that, I think that education is key. People need to realise just because things are available, they don't need to be utilised and people need to realise that there is more to just overindulging them and they need to see there is a bigger picture out there. Personally, no, because I want to keep doing research in it for many years to come. So if we could keep it on the back burner, that'd be great. But um, yeah, no, it, I think it's a long way off. Yeah. But as you say, and not even that, it's coming up now in um, underdeveloped countries as well. So let alone or you're not seeing a tail off, but if you were to see a tail off then in developed countries, you would still see this pull or resurgence that's coming up now from um, undeveloped countries. So I think we've got a long way left to go. Watch this space then uh, as, as it does kick on. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, thank you everyone for your questions and for tuning in and watching this. And Rachel, thank you so much you know, for your expertise and your insights, but for you know communicating and teaching us so effectively. Uh, <laughs> no worries at all. It's been lush to be here this afternoon. No worries, Brad. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.